This is the Road to War Objective 1 about how the Civil War began, and when people are looking for a cause of this war, a lot of them like to point to the election of this guy, Abraham Lincoln, in November of 1860. Now, that's a little bit unfair. Uh, it is true that Lincoln really didn't have any high personal regard for slavery, uh, and he even said so a couple times in speeches, but he never made it a huge part of his campaigning. As a matter of fact, one thing that never made the media articles was the fact that Lincoln even said he didn't really think he could do anything about it. The Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution says that uh, if it's not written in the Constitution, then the issue is up to states to decide for themselves. And back then, there was no amendment outlawing slavery, uh, and there wouldn't be one until 1865. So when Lincoln was running for office, states still had the freedom to decide that issue for themselves. Uh, northern states opposed it, southern states wanted it to happen, but the fact that Lincoln had mentioned a couple of times that he had no real regard for it automatically made southern states uh, concerned, even getting to conversations about that possibly them leaving the country if he were to get elected. Now, of course, Lincoln's view that he couldn't really do anything about it anyway never really made the papers. Uh, and it's also, you know, it has to be considered that the slavery issue had been a hot-button topic in the country for 70 years to that point, maybe a little more. Uh, the Founding Fathers in 1787, when they were coming up with the U.S. Constitution, had big debates between the northern and southern states about whether or not slaves would be considered part of the population, and it took off from there. But by the time we got to the 1860 election, it was pretty obvious that slavery was a powder keg as an issue, and all it needed was a spark. That spark ended up being the election of Abraham Lincoln. What made it even worse for Lincoln is that he couldn't do anything about it right away. Lincoln gets elected in November of 1860 as per the Constitution. Every president before him and every president since him has gotten elected in November. But the Constitution back then also said that you didn't take office until the following March, in Lincoln's case, March 4th of 1861. That's four months! Four months of not getting a chance to sit in the big boy chair or come up with any kind of plan or sign any kind of meaningful legislation that might, you know, eliminate some fears and possibly avoid a civil war. Now, the 20th Amendment in 1933, decades after the Civil War, would eventually change this to January, and uh, nowadays you get elected in November and get your stuff together, and if you have a major problem like this, you know, you're taking office in January, maybe you can do something about it. But back then, Lincoln was still a private citizen for four months who had to watch as the Union broke apart. Now, eventually, we know he's going to end up on Mount Rushmore and be recognized as one of the greatest presidents in our history, but before he even gets to take office, it's kind of a rough start. I mean, think about the ego blow for a second. The South is basically looking at him and saying, we're half the country, and we're leaving because of you. I mean, gee, it really kind of sucks all the fun out of getting elected president and stuff. Anyway, uh, like I said before, the 20th Amendment in 1933, long after the Civil War is over, is eventually going to allow presidents to take office in January. The main reason for that, and it's the reason that the 20th Amendment is called the lame duck amendment, is that they don't want any lame duck presidents. In other words, presidents who either got beat in the election or are finishing their second term or whatever the case may be, presidents that uh, aren't going to be president anymore after the election is over, but are still going to be in office for another four months just kind of sitting on their thumbs and not really doing anything. Lame duck presidents. Now, in this case, the lame duck president was uh, James Buchanan, who was a unionist. Uh, he believed that in keeping the union together. The problem is, is that he had uh, advisors from the South. Most of his, his advisors were from the South. Now, he didn't think that seceding from the union was constitutional, but he really didn't feel like he could attack the South for a couple of reasons. First of all, much of the Union Army was already out west. Uh, the Plains Wars with the Native Americans that would go on for another 30 years were really just about to start. People could see that coming, so they had sent a lot of military out that way. Secondly, if you're going to get into a war, don't be the one who attacks if you're looking for public opinion support. Attacking makes you look like uh, the evil aggressor. It's much better to be the one defending yourself. It's a lot more patriotic. So he was worried that attacking would have caused public support for the South, for the Confederacy, and he didn't want that. So ultimately what he decided to do was wait and see. 
as Lincoln would eventually do when he took office. But while Lincoln's waiting in the wings, James Buchanan is really doing a whole lot of nothing. And frankly, he doesn't end up very high on most lists of greatest presidents ever. In fact, he's usually in the bottom five or so. So, how did Buchanan's wait-and-see approach go? Well, I gotta tell you, not so good. Uh, Remember, Lincoln gets elected in November of 1860. About one month after the election, in December of 1860, during this time when Lincoln was a private citizen, South Carolina, right here, becomes the first state to secede or break away from the Union, the United States, December of 1860. Now, over the next six weeks, the six other lower south states would also secede. Now, when we say the lower south, we're basically talking about all these ones uh, that are along the Gulf of Mexico right here, uh, including Georgia as well. So you're talking about Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, all along the Gulf Coast, and Georgia. Those are considered the lower south states. Now, they all take off with uh, South Carolina in the first six weeks. Now, uh, Lincoln probably didn't feel real good about that, but at least he still had Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware right over in here. Okay, Uh, He still had those. Uh, They were still in the Union. Um, for now. And just to add to Lincoln's fun while he was a private citizen and watching all this stuff happen, in February 1861, again, you know, about a month before Lincoln takes office, the Confederate States of America, also known as the CSA, uh, forms. Now, this flag is probably the one that most people are accustomed to when it comes to the Confederacy. Uh, This is the Confederate battle flag, though, the one you would have seen on top of the General Lee back in the Dukes of Hazzard days. It is not the official flag of the CSA as a country, just the flag used in battle. This is the flag they would have uh, for the CSA for about half the war. And this is the flag that the CSA, the Confederate States of America, would end the war with. Now, I want you to think about the word confederate for just a second here. And remember that a confederation gives more power to the states than a federal system of government does. Remember the old Articles of Confederation that we operated under before the Constitution? Same idea. You know, the idea that the states control more of themselves and a national level of government is pretty weak, so it can't control as much. Well, the southern states had always been adamant about states' rights, the idea that if it's not written in the Constitution, then it's up to states to decide according to the Tenth Amendment. And they'd been adamant about that since the Constitution was formed. Many southerners by the Civil War had in their ancestry people who'd been anti-federalists, people who'd been against big government. Now, a major issue of the war is slavery, don't get me wrong, but the main issue is states' rights, again, the right to choose if you want to have slaves or not. And uh, the Confederates uh, decide in their, in their nation that their first capital is going to be Montgomery, Alabama. Now, the CSA has the exact same constitution as the United States, word for word, with one provision, allowing for slavery. That was the only difference. And the CSA followed the exact same blueprint of the United States for the branches of government. I mean, it's what they knew. So the CSA had a Supreme Court, just like the USA had. They had a Congress, a Confederate Congress, just like the USA. And they also had a president, just like the USA. And their president was Jefferson Davis, also known as Jeff Davis. Now, those of you that are Dukes of Hazard fans might remember J.D. Hogg. Yeah, the character was named after Jefferson Davis, Jefferson Davis Hogg. Now, uh, Jeff Davis got elected to a lot of fanfare in the CSA. Meanwhile, Lincoln had to travel to Washington, D.C. at uh, night and be disguised to avoid any uh, Confederate uh, assassins. It was kind of an inauspicious beginning for Lincoln and a very ceremonial one for Jeff Davis. Okay, so Lincoln is now in office, and he runs into problems pretty much immediately. Immediately. 
Uh, the real beginning of the American Civil War is in April 1861 at a place in South Carolina called Fort Sumter. Now, you can see Fort Sumter. It's this little island right here in the middle of Charleston Harbor. Uh, and uh, this is dealing with kind of a common issue that happened as the Civil War began. Um, as seceding states left the Union, as they broke away, a lot of times they were taking over U.S. property that was within their state borders. You know, South Carolina had broken away from the United States, and uh, Fort Sumter, a United States fort, was within the state borders of South Carolina. So they naturally claimed that it belonged to them. It was theirs. Now, this really puts Lincoln in a bad spot. Uh, the fort itself was low on supplies, but attacking it would be a guaranteed war uh, declaration. So he chooses to send in troops to supply the fort, not to defend it or reinforce it. This boat here, the Star of the West, was brought in, hopefully, to uh, get supplies to the troops at the fort, but it was turned away uh, by uh, Confederate uh, military personnel. Now, Lincoln wasn't really trying to bring in any kind of weapons. He wasn't trying to defend the fort or reinforce the fort in any way. He was just trying to bring in food and medicine for U.S. troops that were in the fort, because Lincoln still saw it as a U.S. fort, even though it was in South Carolina's borders. He didn't recognize that South Carolina was a separate country. He said, it's a U.S. state still. I want it to stay a U.S. state, and that fort belongs to the United States. So he was trying to uh, supply the fort just to, you know, keep the peace. Well, regardless, the South saw this as an act of war. Uh, and this is a good aerial shot of Fort Sumter today. And on April 12th, they attacked the fort and eventually took it over. The North, of course, is now very upset. And the attack on Fort Sumter kind of spurs them on and makes them proud enough uh, to fight. Uh, and the Civil War officially begins. And it just gets better yet, because after the attack on Fort Sumter, now the Upper South states decide that they are also going to secede from the Union and join the CSA. So we're talking about, when we say Upper South, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia. And you can see right here, that little dot, that's Richmond, the town of Richmond, once Virginia joined the CSA, the Confederates moved their capital from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. But what about these border states up here? What's the deal with them? Well, Lincoln's got a couple of problems here because these border states, uh, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, wanted to keep their slaves. And Lincoln knows he's in a bind and can't let that happen. Now, why are these border states such a big deal? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, that's the capital, Washington, D.C., only 100 miles away from the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, in any good game of capture the flag, you don't want them to capture the flag. Your capital is the source of your military power, your governmental decision-making, and it would be kind of embarrassing if you were fending off a group of rebels and they took your capital. So if they would have allowed Maryland and Delaware to join the Confederacy, uh, the capital of the United States would have been completely within the borders of the CSA. Not good. Also, this river right here, the Ohio River, has a lot of prominent industries, and that was a major advantage for the North. If these states would have been allowed to go to the Confederacy, and I'm going to throw West Virginia in this mix too, even though... Uh, they don't really become a state until 1863, halfway through the war. They broke away from Virginia. But if you allow these to become Confederate states as well, you're allowing the Confederates to just jump in and take these factories and all these industrial centers along the Ohio River. And you can't have that either. So Lincoln has to make a call. Uh, if not, the CSA is going to gain industry and surround Washington, D.C. So Lincoln makes a proclamation early on in the war. Not the Emancipation Proclamation by any means. Instead, he says that the war is to restore the Union, not free the slaves. And therefore, the border states will be allowed to stay in the Union and keep their slaves as well. Okay, thanks for listening.